صلوات ربي عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you as we continue today in our second session on striving to perfect our salah and we just want to remind ourselves that the three sessions as I have mentioned, the first session we look at the importance of Salah and the second session today we want to look at the laws that are pertinent to Salah, the actual performance of Salah, the actions of the Salah and then in the third session inshallah we will be looking at some of the spiritual aspects of Salah, bearing in mind that these three sessions would not be sufficient to have a comprehensive understanding on how to perform the Salah in the best of manner. However, hopefully these three sessions, inshallah, will be able to carry us to a great extent and inshallah, it is expected of you, the students, the viewers, to, to read on your own more about this very important pillar of Islam. So you have a handout on today's session where we are going to look at the fiqh of the salah or the conditions of the salah. And this of course is based on a hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Perform the salah as you see me performing it. And there is a book that was written by Sheikh Albani on the topic of Sifatu Salat al Nabi, the description of the prayer of the Prophet. And it is one of the best books that mentions for every part of the Salah, it is justified by a quotation either from the Quran or a saying or a statement or a practice of the Prophet ﷺ. And as we are all aware, my beloved brothers and sisters, anything that we do in Islam or we were asked not to do, it must be based on authentic evidence from the Quran and from the authentic sayings of our beloved Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not about what any person says. If a person tells us something, no matter the status of that person, but if the person cannot substantiate his claims or whatever he's saying with a verse from the Quran or some part of the Quran or an authentic saying of the Prophet wasallam, then we don't have to, to take what that person is telling us. Okay? So this part of the course deals with the laws that are pertinent to the actual performance of the Salah. In the previous handout, we had mentioned a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu said that the key to paradise or heaven is Salah. But, and the key to Salah is Wudu. <coughs> and so we have to perform the Wudu properly. So I don't know if you have that handout. You could always go back to it and... Um, you think we should go, go through the, this tonight, the, um, the wudu? We will see, right? If there is time, inshallah, we can go back to the wudu. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully we will have some time to go back to the wudu, inshallah. All right? Okay, so now, supposing we already have the wudu in place, okay? 
we have already performed a proper wudu according to what has been explained to us. All right? And we are now ready to perform the salah. So now we have to do a few checks on some other things that must be in place before we can actually go into the performance of the salah. And when I talk about the salah right now, I'm talking about the fara'id, the compulsory prayers or salah, the ones that we have to pray throughout the day, five times a day. All right, there are certain things that must be in place. And that is especially the timing. For the other salawat, the same conditions that we are about to look at will also be applicable to the other salawat, with the exception, perhaps, of the time. So let's look at the conditions of the salah. The first one states Islam. And I mention Islam because the worshiper must be a Muslim. You have certain people, sometimes they tell you, you know, we know you are in the month of Ramadan and we are also fasting like you. Because we, you know, we just want to join you in solidarity and we, we want to fast like you. And you may be, some people, some Muslims, they invite some of their non-Muslims uh, friends at their homes. All right? And maybe it might be time uh, for um, prayer and they feel that they can just go and pray. Or sometimes they go even for a Salatul Janazah, a funeral prayer. And sometimes you may see some of the non-Muslims, you know, want to, to join in the prayer. But how could you, the question is, how could you be praying to someone who you have not believed in? How could you accept the branch when you have denied the root? Think about a tree, for example. So the first thing is that the person must believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them to pray to him. All right? So a person must be a Muslim. Okay? The second one is sanity. The second condition is sanity. If a person is insane, a person is not in his or her right senses, then there is no obligation on that person, whether it is for prayer or whether it is to fast in the month of Ramadan or whether to give zakah or go for pilgrimage or any of the obligations in Islam because that person is an insane person. That person is not a normal person, doesn't think like how the normal person would think. And you have people like that, okay? So a person must be sane to, for the law to address such a person. Okay. If a, if a person is insane, that person is not accountable because he doesn't know what is compulsory. He can't differentiate between something that is compulsory and non-compulsory. He doesn't know what is good and what is bad, what is evil and what is good. He, he, he can't differentiate between the two. And the third condition is the person who must pray must have attained the age of puberty because prayer, we are looking at salah, prayer, is not obligatory on minors. All right? So if a person is below the age of puberty, then the person doesn't have to pray. The person would not be sinned for not praying because the person has not yet developed inte intellectually. All right? So a person must reach that age of puberty where the person can understand. A person knows when something is right from when something is wrong. All right? So that person must have reached the age of puberty. Our Prophet wasallam said, Teach your children to pray when they have reached the age of seven. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبْنَاءُ عَشْرِ And 
hit them if you have to when they have reached the age of 10. Of course, this hadith has raised certain alarm to some people. Why should I hit my child to pray? Sometimes people ask that question. And it is a valid question. But imagine you have been training your child to do something for three years or four years because the hadith mentions teach your children to pray from the age of seven. But if you have neglected teaching them from that time and now they have reached the age of 10 and they are not praying, all right, then of course, I mean, why should you beat the child? But you are hitting the child because you have been teaching that child for the three or four years and unto now, that child doesn't want to pray. So then, if you allow that child to grow up like that without that kind of upbringing, then eventually that child may, may go on the wrong path. So the child must know the importance of the prayer, that connection that we talk about between the servant and his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I have mentioned before, that one of the most challenging things to children is when parents want them to pray, when the parents themselves, they don't pray. Right? It's a difficult thing for a child. And children like to emulate their parents. When parents do things, you know, they like to do it. And the little children, the little ones, like three and four years, sometimes when you stand up to pray, they come and stand next to you and they do the actions. But they are playing. But they are doing it. So we have to teach them when they are, when they are small, when they are young. The fourth point under the conditions of salah is purification. And purification, <coughs> it's, it's like a heading and there is a subheading that comes below purification. So purification refers to the person must have purified himself or herself either by a complete bath, if it was necessary for him or her to take that bath, or the person must have performed wudu, the ablution, then the person must attire himself and herself with clean clothing. And then the place where the person is going to pray must also be a clean place. We have been prohibited to pray in dirty places. We are not allowed to pray in places like, like in toilets, like in a, rub by a rubbish heap, or towards graves. Any kind of dirty place, we are not allowed to pray there because prayer is something that we seek to purify ourselves. So how can we go to a dirty place and perform this act of ibadah? Our Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Ju'ilat li al-ardu masjidan wa tahura. The whole earth has been made a place for prayer for me. So why would a person want to choose a dirty place to pray? So under the heading of purification, we have to take into consideration the bath or the ablution, clean clothing, clean place. And of course, the person must try his or her best to go and in a state of mind that he cleans or he cleanses his mind out of all the worldly things because he is about to, to engage in a communication with his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a clean mind is like, imagine if you have to meet with someone of high authority, like the prime minister, or a minister, or a king, before you go to meet that individual, 
you want to make sure that you have everything planned, what you're going to see, because it's a short opportunity that you have to engage with that individual. So how do we think, without making any comparison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His creation, if we have a meeting with our Lord, who is the King of all kings, and the creator of everything, we are now about to have a short meeting with him. So then we have to try to empty our minds from all of these worldly things and thinking and try, try, try our best to see how we could now concentrate on that act of ibadah. So all of that, you know, will come on the uh, purification. Then the next point is the clothing must be appropriate. Appropriate means it must be loose. It's not very tight fitted to reveal the shape of your body. All right? And the face and the feet, it must cover like for sisters, must cover her entire body except the face and the feet below the ankles. For men, the minimum, for men, the minimum part that is to be covered is from the navel to the knees. That's the minimum. But don't choose the minimum to attire yourself if you're going to stand in front of your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, khudhu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. O oh, children of Adam, take your adornment for every place of worship. You're not going to meet the prime minister or the minister or the king with a, a short pants or something from your navel uh, to, your, to your knees covered and the rest exposed. You're going to attire yourself properly. As a matter of fact, there are certain places that you can go except you're dressed in a certain way. You can go to a court with your pants, with your shirt out of your pants. It has to be go inside. You can't go certain places without with the slippers. You have to go with shoes and so on. So if we are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to think about all of these. All right? And you have the reference that you know, tells you how to take your, ador your adornment when you go to pray. All right? And these conditions, they all apply all right, to all the types of salah. Then you must have this other condition must be in place, and that is the worshiper must face the direction of the Kaaba. Now we say the direction of the Kaaba because we are not close to the Kaaba. If you are close to the Kaaba, then you will be facing the Kaaba. If you are in the Al-Masjid Al-Haram, you could see the Kaaba right in front of you. So you will find the people in a circle. But in this part of the world, we say we, we face the east. All right? yeah, so the direction of the Kaaba is called the Qibla. So we face towards that direction. All right? So a person can be you know, facing any direction and say, well, I'm praying now. I'm going to perform salah and you just want to face any direction. Unless you are in a plane and you can't face the direction of the, and it is time for salah and you want to perform your salah on time. All right? Or maybe you're in your car or in a car you're being driven and you want to pray even while you're sitting. Some people do. But you want to pray on time. So then, you will be allowed because there is an ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Whichever direction you turn to, Allah is there. But that will be in conditions that are not normal. All right? Conditions that are normal allows you. Because a person might want to justify not praying by saying, well, I couldn't face the Qibla because I was in a vehicle. 
and the vehicle was going in this direction, and I couldn't face that direction, and so on. And the drive was a long drive, okay? And things like that. But as long as, you know, you are on land, then you must face the direction of the Qibla. And we have to pray these compulsory salah at their specific times, and that is a next condition, the time. The time must arrive. We can't, pray, we can't pray before the time has arrived. You can't tell yourself, well, you know, today I'm very, very busy. I have to leave home very early. Or I have to travel today. All right? My flight leaves at so and so time. So you know what? I'm going to perform Salat al-Fajr at 4 o'clock this morning. In the morning, I'm going to perform Salat al-Fajr, but you still have one and a half hour yet for the time for Salat al-Fajr to reach. You can't do that. You can't pray 10 minutes before, five minutes before. You have to wait for the time to reach. Likewise, you must not wait for the time to leave and go and then want to pray. Don't set your own time. Allah has given us the time. And our Prophet وسلم, has identified the time. Allah told us, Hafizu ala salawat wa salatil wusta. In the salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawkuta. Salah has been prescribed unto the believers at prescribed time. So we have the time. And Jibreel alayhi salam came and told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam about the timings of the salah. Alright, so we should not wait for the time to reach late or the time has gone or you want to hit two at one shot. You wait until the end of one salah and as soon as you finish that one, it's time for the next one one time. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam described that as the prayer of a hypocrite because he doesn't have time to dedicate. Allah has given him 24 hours for the day. And he doesn't have the time. He is always busy. Everybody is busy. Have you seen people on the road, how they drive sometimes? You have a road, you have a, you have a line to follow, a lane to follow. And people just coming out of the lane and taking the shoulder and coming up. Like there are some police or something and they're going. Like they alone, they are, they are hurry. No, but you see when a person is performing their prayer, their salah, the Salah teaches us a lot of things, all right? So precision about timing, prayer teaches us that. Um, Suyam, fasting also teaches us about the precision of timing. When we must stop eating and when we must start eating. Time to break fast and time to start the fast. Exactly. All right, so these are the conditions of Salah, okay? Some of the scholars have mentioned that the niyyah, which is the intention, is a part of, is a condition. But other scholars, they have mentioned the niyyah or the intention as the first compulsory act of the actual prayer. So now that we have looked at the conditions of salah, I think we went through all of them. Did I leave out any? You have the handout in front of you. Yes? Okay. So now we are ready to perform our salah. Okay? So, intention. You must form your intention. Alright? Where does the intention comes, come from? It comes from the heart. Alright? From the heart. Intention is not something that you pronounce verbally. All right? It is just something that you form or you conceive within yourself. Just as how it was your intention to come to the classes today, you did not announce, make an announcement to yourself and say, I am now going to class 
and then you left your homes. But it was inside of you, it was within you that you were going to come to class. So likewise, the salah has to be, you know, the intention has to be born in mind. Okay? Our Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Verily, all actions are judged by intention. All actions, everything that we do, they are judged by our intention. And this is just part of the hadith. All right? It is really informing us that when you do certain things, if you're doing it for people to talk about, you want for people you know, to see what, the, what kind of person you are, you're a, maybe you're a very charitable person, you're doing X, Y, and Z, you have to announce it, let this person know and that person know. So you, you, you're verbalizing it, you're saying it out. All right? You're spoiling it for yourself. You're, not, you're depriving yourself of the reward. So you have gotten the reward there already. You got the praise from the person. But if you have done it for the pleasure of Allah, then it's already here. Only Allah could read our hearts. So He knows what is inside. We don't have to say anything. He knows what is, because we're doing it for His pleasure. So that's why we don't have to say anything that we do. The only time we, we verbalize our intention is when we go for Umrah or for Hajj. And that is because of our Prophet وسلم, taught us to do it like that. So bear in mind, our Prophet وسلم, he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. So I might be saying this hadith every now and then, all right, to remind us. So when we check the authentic narrations or a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, there is no narration or hadith that mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, pronounced his intention. I remember as a, as a little boy when I was learning to pray, there was a little book that we had at home. My mother used you know, to read this book. It's called Talimul Islam. And in that book, I taught myself how to pray. I, I read it. So if a person was reading, um, if a person was praying behind an imam, he was, you know, he was told to say certain things. Like, you have to say, Nawaitu an usalliya lillahi ta'ala rakataini salatul fajr farda hadha al waqt iktudaitu bi hadha al imam mutawajjihan ila jihati al ka'bati al sharifati. And then you say, Allahu Akbar. All of those things. All right, so we have not found anything in the hadith that says that you have to say something like that. All right, so perhaps the older people wanting to teach their followers and their families and they taught them how to say something. All right, so this cannot be substantiated by any authentic source. So we must understand that and know that. All right, I was told to also remind you about the prohibited times as we talk about the time for Salah. All right, the timings for Salah, the time must arrive. There are certain times where we are not allowed to pray. And those times are the times like when the sun is now rising, all right, or when the sun is exactly overhead or when the sun is now setting. So when the sun is now rising, sunrise and su sunset, they're defined differently. Sunrise is when the sun is now peeping up, peeping. That's sunrise. It's now rising. Okay? Sunset is different. It's after the, after the sun now disappears. The sun is setting, it's going down, it's going down, it's going, but it is not sunset yet. It's only after the sun disappears at sunset. So, when the sun is about to set, you're not allowed to pray. When the sun is about to come up, you are not allowed to pray. When the sun is exactly overhead, we are not 
allowed to pray. Why? Because they are people who worship the sun. And we don't want our prayer to look anyway like their prayer that we pray at those times. So we were prohibited to pray at those times. Okay, so now we are finished, I think, with the Niniya. We move to the next point, which is called Al Qiyam. Qiyam is the standing position. Okay, it is compulsory. It is all the, all the points that are mentioned here come under the category of the compulsory acts of prayer. All right, they are called the wajibat of the salah. Okay. So, you must stand up. This is called Qiyam. All right? Standing up. It is compulsory for the worshiper to stand as long as he or she has the ability to stand. Allah says, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ All right? In the part of the ayah where Allah says about حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْغُسْطَى وَقُومُوا قُومُوا means stand up. لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ for Allah's cause, qanitin means in obedience, devoutedly. I have noticed sometimes there are some people who could walk to come maybe from their car or even walk from their homes to the masjid. But then when they reach to the masjid, because they know it is allowed to sit and pray, they just go and sit down. While everyone else is standing up, they are sitting down. They say, well, you know, I'm weak. I can't stand up for long. And all kinds of excuses people make. Well, you have to understand that the standing is one of the obligatory acts of the prayer. And if you don't stand up, then you would not get the full blessings of your salah. So you could still, you could stand up and if you can't make the ruku or you can't make the sujood, then you could sit on the chair. But when it is time to stand up, you should stand like the others. If you can't make to go down on the ground, then you could sit on the chair. So a lot of people sometimes, they, you know, they make that mistake and they need to know about it. Okay? So this standing up, we have... You know, the reference for it. And our Prophet Wasallam also said, pray standing, but if you can't stand up, if you can't stand up, then sitting. And then if you can't, on your side means lie down. So those same people who you want to sit down all the time, when it's time to go home, they get up for themselves and they're gone. You know, and they're walking normal. How, how could you do that? You know, so it, it's not something that could be, you know, treated so lightly. It's important that you stand up. Or else you just get half of the blessings. All right, the next point is Takbiratul Ihram. Takbiratul Ihram is the first takbira, what we say when we now start our salah. It's called Takbiratul Ihram. Takbiratul Ihram from the word Haruma, ihram is a derivative of the word harwa, which means to be prohibited. All right? So it means to say that now you have entered into the prayer by raising your hands and saying Allahu Akbar. And now it is prohibited because the word haram means prohibited. So ihram is from the same root. It means it is now prohibited for you to utter anything that is not of the prayer or to do anything as a matter of fact that is not a part of the prayer it's, it's we are not allowed to be looking all over the place you see allahu akbar and then you hear some footsteps somebody coming late and you're watching back you know i have seen people doing that you don't do that or if they feel like they're not giving a full look back they're doing like if they fool in somebody, you fool just fool in yourself. Don't do that. Okay? Don't do that at all. You have to, where, are, where do you look? You look at the place where your forehead is going to touch. Alright? That's the place 
where you're going to look. When you say Allahu Akbar, it's also important for you to know how you raise your hands. If you say Allahu Akbar, you don't raise your hands, it's also allowed. If you don't raise your hand at all. But it is a sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to raise your hands. What did the Prophet وسلم, said? Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Perform the prayer as you see me performing the prayer. So why would you not want to raise your hands? There are some people who want to show their scholarship sometimes. To do something to aggravate certain people. They know that the minimum that they can do is just say Allahu Akbar. And they're praying just to start a kind of an argument. You have people like that. Yes, and a long argument. For what? When they could have just simply raised their hands. Okay, how are you going to raise your hands? Your hands have to be open like this and it must be facing the Qibla, the direction of the Kaaba. All right? So you don't raise it like this. You don't raise it like this. Don't raise it like this. Or anything like that. Facing the Qibla. And to what height? How high should I raise my hands? How high should I raise my hands? All right? So you have a lot of people sometimes when, you know, they are going to pray and they say, Allahu Akbar. They just go like, Allahu Akbar. Just like, Allah, like, like a little flick like that. Allah Akbar. It's not like that. It's not supposed to be like that. Okay? It's supposed to raise it anywhere between our shoulders and our earlobes. So, if the tips, the tip of my fingers were to reach right here, that is correct. And that is acceptable. If it goes <coughs> up to here, Right by the, by the ears, right here. All right? All of that is good. Even if it touches it, that is okay. All right? I remember a long time, we were told by our imam, yeah, your, your thumb has to touch your earlobes like this. All right? Mashallah, you know, he, he just wanted to make sure that you make sure at anywhere between there is a touch it. So you're sure you touch it. May Allah bless him. <coughs> All right? So this, according to the hadith, it's anywhere between here. Okay? So, we understand how we should raise our hands, what height, how it must be facing. All right? We know all of that. When should we raise our hands? We could raise it as soon as we say, Allahu Akbar. That's simultaneously with the words and the action, they go together. Or, you can say, Allahu Akbar, and then you go like that. All right? So the words came just before. All right? Or you go like this. Allah, you raise your hand like this, and then you say, Allahu Akbar. All of that is correct. <coughs> but try to, you know, try to do it close to each other. Simultaneously is the best, together with it, with the action. All right? Now, where do we look? I said we look at the point where my forehead is going to rest on the ground. That's where I'm going to, to look. How am I going to put my hand now? Which part should I put my hand? My two hands, all right? So you have a lot of people, you know, have different places where they put their hands, all right? So you have some people they put their hands here, which is the best position. But some people may have read hadith that says, Allah Sadr, on the chest, they go like this. Then they have some of them, they go by their heart like this, they're protecting their heart. Or they're showing their love, expressing their love to Allah subhanahu wa my heart is for you. All right? Or you have some of them go quite over their neck. And then you have some quite down below here. All right? So these are extreme positions. You don't go like that. You go anywhere between here, this point here, where your chest is, 
to here. All of that is good, right? Anywhere here. And how do you put your hands? All right? The right hand over the left hand. Okay? And it should be like this. Right here, like that. If you do it like this, it is also accepted. But not like this. Not like this. Some people do it like this. A lot of people do it like this. That's not correct. Okay? <coughs> and this is explained in hadith um, of Wa'il ibn Hijr. And it is an authentic hadith. Okay? So I think we have understood everything about that first takbiratul ihram. When we now enter into the prayer and how we are now focusing there. And our eyes, our eyes should be opened. Because if you're going to look at the place of sujood, how are you going to have your eyes closed? All right. Then we are not looking at the place of sujood where you're going to make your sujood because your eyes close. All right. Some people try to justify closing their eyes by saying, well, I can concentrate better when I close my eyes. Or there are too many distractions outside there. All right, so I close my eyes. I can concentrate better. But do you know that when you close your eyes, your mind is now open to the world of imagination? When you close your eyes. Okay? So you have to open your eyes. And now this is the point. Despite of all of the distractions that you have around you, you would not allow those distractions to distract you from your focusing on what you are doing here, your prayer. You, are com you have already started, you have engaged yourself in this act of ibadah. All right? So, that is what you do. You look to the ground right in front of you where your sujood is going to be done. Then we move to the next point, which is Qira'atul Fatiha. The recitation of Suratul Fatiha. This is the opening chapter of the Quran, and it's also referred to Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book. Any prayer that does not have Suratul Fatiha, it is in, incomplete, it is deficient. And the Prophet ﷺ said so three times. Man lam yaqra' bi fatihatil kitab. Whosoever does not recite Suratul Fatiha or Ummul Kitab, fahuwa khidaj, khidaj, khidaj. Then, or fahiya khidaj. Then the salah is deficient, deficient, deficient. All right? Whosoever prays and did not recite in the prayer with the mother of the book, Surah Al-Fatiha, then his salah is incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. And when you are reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, you take your time and you recite it, and you try to pronounce every letter properly. Many people, they cannot recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly. And that is very sad. Imagine how many times we said yesterday, how many times we were reciting it, 17 times a day, 119 times, you know, for the week and so on. So, and you, every time you're doing it wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong, all the times you're doing it wrong and you never pay attention about trying to perfect it and to better it. And you think that you, you, know, you have it right or you're praying. You're praying five times a day. And I have listened to so many people reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in the various masajid and the amount of mistakes that people make, you know, it is very sad. Like simple letters, they make major mistakes. Like the Ain, they can't pronounce the Ain properly. 
Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Alameen Instead of A A A in the A in Ya 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 Kanabudu Nabudu I don't want to rep- uh, I, want, I, don't, I don't like to say it the wrong way because it comes like I'm changing up the correct way I don't like to say it alright but pronouncing the word wrong Sirat Sirat like a Sirat Sirat Allah it's wrong. You're changing the sword to a sin. The to, to a to a ta. Mustaqim. Instead of mustaqim, qim, mustaqim. Upper throat instead of lower. All of these are major mistakes. Major mistakes. Minor mistakes is like when you like might miss out a rule of tajweed recitation. <laughs> you understand? So if we're reciting the surah. Try to recite it properly. If you don't know how to recite it properly, get someone to teach you how to recite it properly. You have to let someone listen to you or else you would not know where you are making your mistakes. Don't think that you are listening to the best of reciters and you have learned it properly. Not until and unless someone listens to you. Okay? Someone has to listen to you. Someone who knows it properly listen to you and tell you yes you have it correctly pause between every ayah let me read this hadith for you where our prophet sallallahu sallam he said he said i have divided the salah between myself and my servant in two this is a hadith Qudsi. Qudsi means it is Allah saying, but in the words of the Prophet وسلم, in which the Prophet وسلم, is telling us that Allah said that He has divided this surah, Surah Al Fatiha, into two between Himself and His servant. And His servant will have whatever. He asks for. The servant will have whatever he asks for. When the person says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, Hamidani, Rab, Hamidani Abdi. He says, My servant has praised me. When he recites the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant has extolled me. When he recites the next ayah, Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, My servant has glorified me. And he says, He says, This is between me and my servant. And when he goes and he says, Guide me to the straight path. He says, This is for my servant. He's asking to guide him. He's asking me to guide him. And my servant will get, would have, Whatever he is asking for. Now you understand why you say Amin. Why you must you must know why you say Amin. What are you saying Amin? To what are you saying Amin? Oh Allah, let it be so. So this brings me back to the point that I was making in the first session. If we do not make the effort to understand what we are saying in our salah, then how can we concentrate in our prayer? How can we perfect our salah if we do not try to understand the things that we see in our salah? After Surah Al-Fatiha, if you are reciting silently, it is also important for us to know. Supposing it is a salah that you are praying silently, all right? Then you have to move your lips. Okay? So look at me. I'm reciting Surah Al-Fatiha now. <coughs> My lips and my tongue moving. But you have a lot of people, Allahu Akbar, and they're reciting Surah Al Fatiha now. And they're gone. Alright? Because when you read in your mind without moving the lips and the tongue, it goes faster. You have to slow down. So, how, what will slow you down is 
the movement of the lips and the tongue. Now, because I have your handout here, I have been following the handout, I just remember that, you know, there are important elements that we must also see um, in the Salah, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So, I forgot to mention that when you say Allahu Akbar, the first takbirah, you, and you put your hand, we are supposed to recite what is called um, Dua al-Istiftah. All right, the fana, some people say, right? That is, you say it silently. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika wa tabaraka smuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruka. All right, you say this dua. This is one out of many. All right, yeah, there is another one that you could say. Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayaya kama ba'adta bayna al-mashriqi wal-maghrib. Allahumma... Allahumma naqini min khatayaya kama yunaqqa thawbu al-abiyadu min al-danas. Allahumma gsilni bil ma'i wa thalji wa al-barad. Alright? So basically this dua means, Oh Allah, distance me from my sins as you have distant or separated the east from the west. Oh Allah, cleanse me of my sins as white garment is cleansed from dirt. O oh Allah, wash me of my wash my sins of me with water, hail, and snow. Basically, a, you know, a brief translation of that um, du'a. Then, after that um, du'a, which is said silently, we say "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Also silently, then "Bismillahi rahman rahim Also silently. All right, and this is in accordance to that same hadith that I have just mentioned where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided the surah into two. The first thing that was mentioned in, in that hadith was Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen not the Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alright? So, so I forgot to mention those two important things. Alright? So the dua al istiftah A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Then the Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Then Surah Al-Fatiha. We finish with Surah Al-Fatiha. Remember, any rak'ah that doesn't have Surah Al-Fatiha, it is incomplete, it is invalid. You must recite Surah Al-Fatiha in every rak'ah of every salah. And after Surah Al-Fatiha, you recite a next surah of the Quran, a short surah, or any other part of the Quran. All right? A short um, portion of any part of the Quran. Then we go to the next one, which is called Ruku. Number five. Ruku is the bowing position. So when we say Allahu Akbar, we raise our hands like this. All right? The same way how we raise it. Okay, I'm sitting long, so it's hard for me to go like this. Like this. All right? So we raise like hand, Allahu Akbar, and then I go to Ruku. And in Ruku, the position is that you keep, try to keep your back horizontal to the ground. So, like this. Alright? Like this. And not like some people like this. Like they oh, all, like, I can't, uh, can't make them bend them back. And then like some who want to like show off, they're going like this. <laughs> right? They want to show you how much they could bend. You have people like that. They just want to create an impression. You know? <laughs> uh, so you don't do that. You, in, according to the hadith, it mentions that if a container of water was placed on the, on the back of the Prophet وسلم, while he is in that position, it will remain there without spilling uh, the water. All right? And then in Ruku, you have where you put your hands all right, the hands goes on the knees, on the knees, not on your thigh or not here by your leg, all right, on your knees. That's where you put your hands, okay? You grab your knees like that. So, ruku. What do we say in ruku? Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. If you add Subhana Rabbi al wa bihamdihi, that is also correct and it is also mentioned in hadith, okay? 
So while you're in Ruko, if you say it one time, that is deferred, compulsory. The sunnah is three. So we move in for the three all the time. We want the sunnah. We want what? Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you see me pray. He said it three times. So we're doing it like how he said it. Three times. Okay? And three times allows, allows us to spend ample time in ruku. It have some people, they just go for ruku. Again, ruku. Quick. Watch, watch me. Allahu Akbar. Done, finished. Because one time it is. Huh? Quick. No, you have to stay there. Let the bones go in place there. When you raise from ruku, that is the next, the next um, wajib of the salah. Right? So number six is supposed to be raising from the ruku. Um, while we are still in ruku, I must mention this hadith. What the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the worst of people are those who steal from their salah. The companions, Ridwanullahi alayhim, said, and how is that so? How can a person steal from the salah? He said, when he does not complete his ruku. You don't make it properly. So don't do it halfway, do it with your back horizontal. And spend enough time. When you raise from the ruku, that is number six. Put in number six, raising from ruku. When we raise from ruku, we also raise our hands. So when we say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, you go like that. All right? Now your hands could come at the side here, at the side, or you could put it back like this. All right? You could still put it back. Both of them are correct. Okay? Both are correct. If you put back your hands here or you leave it on the side, both correct. When you raise from ruku, we say, Rabbana walakal hamd or Rabbana lakal hamd. Or, Allahumma Rabbana lakal hamd. Or, Allahumma Rabbana walakal hamd. Four different things you could say. Minimum. Rabbana walakal hamd. Alright, so when we, if the Imam is leading the salah, he says, Sami Allahu liman hamida. What does that mean? What's the meaning of Sami Allahu liman hamida? Allah? Allah what? Hears. The one who? Praises him. Imagine. How many of us know the meaning of? And we say it all the time. Alright? So we praise in him. So we're responding to that praise. We're praising him. Rabbana lakal hamd. Rabbana wa lakal hamd. And if you, you go more than that. Hamdan kathirun tayyiban mubarakan fi mil sama wati wal ardwa mil ma shitta min kul kul shay ahla thana ya haqqa and so on and so on. You could say more and more things. All of these are mentioned. Details are mentioned in the books of Salah. Alright? Then we, we go for sujood. Alright? After we raise from ruku, we go for sujood. Sujood is the prostration. And while in the prostration, you make sure that seven parts of your body touch the ground. Seven parts of the body must touch the ground. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Umirtu an asjuda ala sabah. I have been commanded to prostrate on seven. So the seven things, you see how I have on my, my headwear here? If I leave it just like this to go and pray, I would not be touching on my, my forehead. So I have, to, I have to move it out. Move it, push it up. Alright? And I have, so the seven parts are the, the forehead and the nose together. Not only the forehead, for it along with the nose is counted as one. The two hands and two knees and the tip of our toes. That makes seven. Where we, when we are in that position of sujood, when we are going down, all right, 
If you go with your hands touching the ground first, it is allowed, it is accepted. If you go with your knees first, it is also correct. Older people can't make it with their knees first. They will have to go with their hands first. All right? So, <clears throat> whichever one you do, you go down. When you go down for sujood now, where do you put your hands? Look on the table here. You put your hands right where, anywhere between where your ears are here. All here is good. Not like this, ahead, or not so much to the back. Right here. How far? Close here. Not too far out. You remember people praying next to you. And then you don't want your elbows to be touching the ground. All right? Our Prophet Wasallam described that as the dog sitting. So he described, he said, don't prostrate like how a dog is. You raise your elbows off the ground. It is important to do that. Be mindful of that. When you are in sujood also, make sure that your toes are touching the ground. Some people, when they go for sujood, they lift it up like that. All right? They don't, let, don't lift it off. Let it remain on the ground. All right? With the, with the toes facing towards the, the qibla. And your fingers also should be closed like this, closed and facing the qibla. Not like this. Or like this, right? I also forgot to mention about when you're standing up, some people they like to, to open their feet too wide. All right? I have a lot of these young brothers. Like they want to, like they're crossing a bridge or something. All right. And um, like we, um, we have been taught, <laughs> we have been taught like as little children when you're going to, when you're standing up, you have to measure four fingers with the heel, where the heel is, and eight fingers for the front, <laughs> all right? So that is not authentic. That was just like an average, but you should stand, like, open your feet just to the, the width of your, your shoulders, but don't go too far. But you have some people say, well, you know, the person is too far away. You had to fill up the gaps. There's only so much you could go. You're reaching out already enough. Don't go further than that. If he doesn't want to come closer to you, well, that's his problem. But you have opened up enough. You have exten extended yourself enough. All right? So don't go. Coming back to the sujood, we finish with sujood. And what do we say in sujood? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Glory be to my Lord, the Most High. The Most High. There are other things you can say in ruku and also in sujood. All right? In both, they have many things you could say. For example, in, in the sujood, you could say, When you're in, in ruku, you could also say extra things. All of these things, you can say extra things, you know, to prolong. When you raise from the, from the ruku, also remain standing. Let your bones Go back in place. Don't rush it. So as soon as some people, as soon as they raise from ruku and they stand up, they're gone straight down. They don't give a, their, their, their body a chance for the bones to go back. So you now, you like you raise from ruku, Sami Allah, Liman Hamida, Allah, don't go on down already. No, Sami Allah, Liman Hamida. Rabbana walakal, remain there. Rabbana walakal ham. All right, then you go for sujood. Okay? So, sujood, we finish with sujood. Then we have Al, al jalsatul ula which is not a fard compulsory but it is a sunnah of the prophet sallallahu to sit after two rakat you, you sit down and you recite at tahiyat at tahiyatul lillahi wa salawat wa tayyibat and your hands resting partially on your knees and your thigh all right so part on your, on your thigh and part on the knee, okay? And the right, the right hand, this index finger is extended like this, making a circle with your middle finger and your thumb. Like, or if you close it like this and make a fist, it is also correct, all right? And you extend it like that, okay? Um, you have, um, what do you say, different opinions among scholars 
with regards to the details of how this finger should move or it should even move. Some people circle it like that. They don't circle it. All right, some people do it like that. Don't do that. Some people say tapping on the head of shaitan, all kinds of different things you hear, right? Just keep it like that. All right, if you move it a little bit, sometimes that's okay. All right, but leave it extended there. All right, so that's the first. When you get up after the second raka'a, which is you're now standing up for the third raka, and you say, Allahu Akbar, you have to raise your hand one more time, and then you put it like this. All right? And then you complete the, um, the next, and you go back, and you sit down again. I know the time is, like, I think I, think I crossed the time already. We have over three minutes again. So we have to sit down the second time if you're performing uh, Salatul Maghrib or any Salah that has four raka'at. You're sitting down for the second time. When you're sitting down, your right foot, your right foot has to be up, all right? When you're sitting down, you have to sit on your left foot. That's when you're sitting the first time. After performing two rakat, when you're sitting down, you're sitting on your left foot and your right foot like this. So I don't know how I'm going to demonstrate that. Can I sit on top of this? Huh? Yeah, it wouldn't break because it's resting flat. All right. So uh, it's like this. Okay. Sorry to ba be back in you, but I have to demonstrate it. It's like this. Okay. Like this we have to. This is when we're sitting the first time. So notice I'm sitting on the left foot. And the right foot is like this. Okay? The toes still face in the direction of the Qibla. When I come to sit the second time, all right, this is how it goes now. Look at it carefully. This one goes underneath here. This one is called, this one is called, um, Iqa. And this one is called Tawarruk. Like this. Alright, so it go on here, underneath here, and this one like that. Alright? <laughs> and um, when I'm sitting, when I'm sitting, alright, okay? Like this, my hands like this, left hand like this, and this one like this. Alright? It's like either like this, or like this. Still focus there. Some scholars say you focus on the finger. Some say it's any between finger and here. Sujud part. All right? All of those are allowed. All right? So. To end the prayer is the taslim or the salam. So what do we say in the last, the final sitting? The uh, tahiyat and the salat al Ibrahimiyah. All right, at tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. You could get that in any of the books of the um, teaching us salah. And Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. And after that, you can make any dua that you want to make. And there are many ad'iyah that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that we could say. All right, the time, we're running out of time, so we can't mention uh, these. All right, so that inshallah brings us to the end of just the physical of the salah. But yet to, to be covered is the spiritual. The spiritual aspect, which is the most important because that is like the soul of the salah. Think about a person without a soul. Dead. All right? You have any questions before we close off? We have one from online. One question online. The sitting for women is the same. Yes. Our Prophet Sallallahu did not differentiate the women from the men. They are sitting and also the Salah. <coughs> there are some people who say like when you're going for sujood, the woman is not allowed to open her hands like this. She had to be closed, like she's closing up herself and so on. And things like that. And sitting and so on is different. Remember the sisters, you know, they're praying at the back. Nobody's going to stare them down. And so the Prophet did not differentiate between the women um, 
salah from the men's salah. Both of them, they are the same. Okay, that's the online question, one question, alhamdulillah. So, jazakumullah khairan. Tomorrow, inshallah, we will be looking at the, um, the, the next aspect of the salah, which is the spiritual aspect, inshallah. So, make sure you come for that session. And also, if you have some questions for me, inshallah, you could ask the questions. Subhanakallahum wa hamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you.